I'm Ryan, this is Rolls in the Family, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the game Final Girl, which is a solo-only game about being the final girl in a horror film and trying to survive and stave off the killer. And it's a game that, despite I am not a fan of uh, horror films at all, but for a cooperative or a solo game, it is a very nice theme for some exciting moments and fun gameplay. And Final Girl has become one of my go-to um, games solo. And I thought it'd be fun to put together a video just ranking a lot of the content that I've been playing over seasons one and two. I will link all of that down in the description below if you want to check any of these sets out for yourself. Anything down there will help support the channel. But just to give you some context here, I at this point have played Final Girl 35 times. I, of the 10 locations across season one and two, I've played each of them at least twice, one with whichever killer came with that location and with a different killer because you can mix and match everything in Final Girl, which is one of its biggest strengths, honestly. Uh, same thing with the killers. I've played all 10 of them more than once on their own map and on another map. And then I think I have 26 Final Girls. I don't have every promo Final Girl, so I guess this isn't uh, comprehensive. But of the 26 that I have, I have played all of them at least once, one with most of them. Um, I usually try to replay the ones that I haven't won with yet. And so I'd like to think that that all gives me a very, you know, balanced and objective view to be able to to rank these things. But let's be honest, this is completely arbitrary, <laughs> these lists. Like, you know, some of these things I haven't played within the last year as I've been working through the content. And it's such a small sample size to be drawing from that's really just, it's really anecdotal on my own experience. And the other thing is Final Girl, one of its biggest strengths is the variety that you get even within the same setup, like even using the same kill in the same location. There's tons of different events that could come up and items that can come up and the way the randomness plays out. And so I would not read too much into my rankings here. This is more of just a fun way to get to talk about a lot of the content across the two seasons um, and just give kind of my thoughts based on some of my experiences with it thus far. But we got a lot of things to rank here. So we're going to jump in starting with the locations. And the other thing I'll call out here is with all of these locations, killers and final girls, there's some that are going to be at the bottom of the list, but there are none that I would say I dislike or would choose not to play with, which is really a testament to the design, the designers behind final girl and the system they have and how they're able to expand it with all this variety that I want to use all the variety. And so just because something's at the bottom of my list doesn't mean I don't like it. I actually do like it, and it was kind of hard to decide, but something has to drop to the bottom. And in the case of locations, that is going to be the Carnival of Blood uh, map. So this is, you know, the Carnival. It comes with the Geppetto, uh, like, puppeteer killer. Um, and so it's kind of a cool setting. Really, the reason this drops for me is it's got this mechanism with these traps that you basically shuffle these traps into the item decks at the beginning of the game. And if you happen to draw those, like when you're searching, they're pretty negative effects that like you get hurt by these traps. And I don't love this mechanism mainly because it makes me not want to search, which is one of the fun things to do in the game. And often you need to search because you need to find some weapon or something to be able to kind of finish out the game and have a chance against the killer. But I don't love that, like, the main thing in the map is this very random negative thing that, like, disincentivizes me from doing one of the fun things in the game, which is to go search for items. can feel very swingy if instead of getting a good item, um, you get hit with one of these traps. Uh, so not my favorite. I still have a good time playing on it, but it can be pretty swingy with those traps. And I tend to prefer when, like, the harmful things aren't disincentivizing me from doing the things that are most fun to do in the game. Uh, after Carnival of Blood, at my number nine, I'm going to have Sacred Groves. So Sacred Groves has this interesting mechanism with like the, you're angering the divine gods by being on this sacred land. And there's this track that you track, like how much um, you've, you 
have gone up on that and then it can trigger at different times and, it, and depending on how much you've angered them, the, the effects are much, much worse. And it adds an action card that you can, can basically reduce that amount. So you can kind of mitigate it by making sure you get this action and, and handle that. Um, I don't know if it's just the games I've had against this map, but it has definitely felt pretty brutal with how that track has uh, affected me. And I don't know that I, it's, it's hard for me to pinpoint why, but I don't find myself loving how that all works. It's fine, you know, but, and maybe it's just, I got killed on it a few times and it discouraged me. Um, but I, it, it ends up kind of dropping a little. It also has this thing with, um, I think there's three locations on the map that are kind of like specially sacred. And there's a lot of the different events and things that'll reference things, which is cool though. I also find sometimes I'm like, you know, on the other side of the map and it's like, Oh, you know, for all the people that are in this sacred place, something really bad happens. And it's like, Oh man, there's just nothing I really could have done about it. It always feels a little weird to complain about some of the RNG stuff in final girl, because that is so much of the game. And then like, um, even a lot of the things I love about the game are with the RNG. But for some of those reasons, that's why Sacred Grove drops a bit for me. Uh, number eight, I have um, a season two map, which is the Storybook Woods. This is the big bad wolf kind of, uh, what's the word? I want to say fable, fairy tale story uh, type map. Um, and it's got some interesting aspects. It's, it's definitely the very vanilla map of season two. Like, and I appreciate them putting in something that's very, you know, I don't have to sit and remember a bunch of rules to play this map. Um, I think what makes it kind of most different is one, it's very small. Like there's just not a lot of, uh, different spaces, which means you're not far from things most of the time. Um, which is interesting both with, you know, saving the victims, but also with the killer out there. I, I think there's just not a lot that excites me about this map. There's a little bit with the river and like bringing people over bridges. That's more of just like an inconvenience than a compelling mechanism for me. Um, I don't know. I haven't played it a whole lot at this point, but it's kind of just like, yeah, it's a, it's a map. It doesn't have like a lot that, you know, I dislike about it, but that gets me excited about it either. Uh, which brings us then to an interesting one. This is Station 2891. This is like the Arctic Outpost map. Um, and this one is very different um, and has some pretty unique mechanisms. The main one being there is only one exit space, which is kind of like the helicopter landing pad. And the only way you can get victims out is via this helicopter. And so... It, when I first read the rules of this, I was like, this sounds impossible because like so much of Final Girl is saving victims and getting it on your, the abilities on your Final Girl so you can unlock your Final Girl ability. Well, the helicopter only has, I think it's three slots of people it can hold. So it can only hold three people. And so you have to bring people to the helipad and then decide when the helicopter is going to take off. So if you want to fill it to three, you got to get them all there at the same time. And then it takes like, multiple turns of there's like this extra action card called fly faster that tells basically gets the helicopter to move on this little there's like a token on a card that says how close it's getting to actually dropping off these people so there's like this delay to even dropping them off and considering them saved so that you can get those abilities and then the helicopter has to fly back before you can do anything again um in practice, I actually found it worked pretty well. Like it didn't feel, it was very, you had to manage it. You have to really be thinking about it and the timing of things, but it didn't feel nearly as like brutal as I, I thought it was going to be based on um, the reading of it. Um, but it's also not one that I think I want to like play all the time. Like it, it is a very different feel with managing that helicopter. The rest of the map is cool with the outpost. It's got this other thing with the outdoor space is potentially having hypothermia. So a lot of the, um, terror cards will say anybody that's outside like gets a cold marker and if you already have one they take a damage which in the case of victims it just means they're dying um, and so it's it's another kind of negative thing you have to manage um, and so I, I like it we're getting into the and again I like all these but I think we're getting a little bit more into like me feeling more positive than neutral about them um, I think just with the helicopter thing it's not something I want to play all the time uh, next up, we have a fairly vanilla a one from season one, which is Maple Lane, kind of a neighborhood map. The, the kind of catch in this one is that there are a ton of search locations. Like normally a map only has like three of these places that you can search for items. Here, 
there's like three houses in every quadrant that all can be searched for items in that quadrant. However, you have to like convince the people at the house to let you into the house to search. So there is this new um, action card that allows you to basically convince them. Um, and so you have to get successes on that to even get into those spaces to be able to search. Um, so it's kind of an interesting dynamic. I wa- like it's annoying to have to do that to get to, to have to get this action card. And, you know, depending on how you're cycling your cards, you might not have that at a time that you want to get in. Um, but I do like there are so many you're always close to a search space, like no matter where you are in the street. And so like there's more there more opportunities to get to search spaces without having to like traverse the map. Um, and I, I do like the theme here. I think it's just a fun map of kind of just the neighborhood, like just the, the stories that evokes the images in your head, I think is cool. And I, I've had some fun events happen here. It's hard for me to judge the locations much on like the events at this point. Cause again, that's one of those things. There's a whole deck of them. I've played a few times on each map. I haven't seen most of them. I don't want to give too much weight because I happen to have a good experience with an event card. Um, but I've had some cool stuff happen on this map. Um, and yeah, it's a solid one that I, I like coming back to. Next up, we have the classic Camp Happy Trails. This was kind of the first um, one in season one. And it's the, you know, kids camp in the forest around a lake environment. And I think that's part of why I like it is it's just kind of a fun, again, a fun um, setting for it. I think um, I also appreciate that it's it's a very simple map. Like there's times where it's very fun and you actually see as I go up this list, some of my favorite maps are the ones that kind of have more going on and you almost have to like refresh yourself on the rules every time you play. It is fun to come to one like Camp, ha- Camp Happy Trails that I can just play. Like I don't have to, I don't have to remind myself of any rules. I can just play. Um, and it's got a kind of an interesting structure of being kind of the big, circle around the lake and then it's got the the one space to go through the lake but there's a lot of different events that kind of like play with how the lake um is coming into play um so just good solid map camp happy trails my number four is actually gonna be my highest rated of the season one maps and this one actually surprised me that this one is the one that rose to the top for me but it's actually creech manor and I think really the reason is one, it kind of falls in that bucket of like, there's not a lot of rules overhead. So it's kind of nice to just come and play, but it is the one map that is like vertical because you're in a, like a mansion. And so you're actually seeing yourself go up floors and go into different rooms. And I think that's just fun to have a map. That's a little different that way. Like, and just the way it paints what's happening. Um, it's got some interesting stuff with being able to like go out the windows, but then you can only go up back through the door. So you know, I've had so many instances of, you know, get climbing out the window with victims. We got to get out of here and then go back to the front door to run back in and help someone else. Um, and so, yeah, I like just the uniqueness of the, the vertical map and kind of the theme there. Um, it's a fun one to come back to, which means my top three are all season two maps. Um, and my number three is going to be Wingard Cottage. So this is kind of cottage out by the lake. Um, and one, I just think it's the layout of it is nice and the theme of it. You've got kind of the house with the rooms in the house, but then you got all the outside kind of grass spaces going down the hill to the lake that has kind of the um, shack down at the lake. Um, I find that just like it makes for some fun stories of when you're hiding in the house and when you're running around the house and some of that. It also has this interesting like crafting mechanism. So there's different spaces that you can collect a certain type of resource. It's like wood or I don't know, tools or something. And then you have this deck of cards that you've revealed a few from of things that could be crafted depending on if you get the right things. You can then craft these special items. Some of them actually require you to have found an item. Like if you have the baseball bat, you can now make the baseball bat that's got like nails in it or something. So it's a little twist that, you know, depending on how the your game is going, you may not use it all. You may use a lot. You may have the opportunity to get something that's really key. But I kind of like that little injection of like it, you know, and you'll see that with some of my favorite maps are the ones that like can really differentiate sessions. And so like you could have a session where that's a big deal and you make that happen. And I, I think that's cool. So I enjoy and I've had some very good games on Wingard Cottage. Next up, I have number two, Wolf Asylum. Um, this is the in- insane asylum 
map. And what's interesting about this one, besides having just kind of a good layout and kind of a creepy theme, is it introduces these pills that are in the insane asylum. You actually start the game with one. There's some scattered on the map that you can collect. And each of these pills is a color. There's one of three colors. And if you just have one pill, you could choose to just use it for like that color's effect. There's just some easy things like, you know, getting some time or I forget what they all are. Um, but those can be really big for like, you just really need something in the moment. But what you really want to do is collect multiple pills. Cause if you get multiple pills, you start stacking some more powerful effects. Um, and if you can manage, I think you need to get all three pills, um, to be able to get these special amped up cards. And it's funny because when you spend to do it, you know you're getting an amped up card, but you don't know what it's going to be. And you're going to have to draw side effects because the more pills you are mixing, you have to draw these side effect cards that might not do anything, but might do something negative. Um, and so there's kind of a little bit of push your luck, but generally the effects you're getting are stronger. And especially like those amped up cards are like insane abilities. And so I really like this twist because you know this is added on regardless of what killer you're playing and i love how dynamic it is with how you react to using it like you could be trying to get those pills but there could be a key situation that you're able to you know get accomplish something because you had a pill that you could spend but you have to decide is it worth spending now instead of saving up and then kind of that like long shot of potentially getting one of these amped up cards that is so powerful and will make your session feel very different um very fun. I, I think it's a very cool, it's not overly complicated um, compared to some of the other ones having to, you have to remember a little bit how it works, but it's not too much. Um, so yeah, I've had very fun games on Wolf Asylum, which brings m us to my favorite, which is the USS Conrad. This is the alien themed ship. You're out in space, something is on the ship. And this is one that actually surprises me that has ro risen to the top. Because my first experiences with it was like, man, this has a lot of like extra rules that I need to learn. And especially when I played just the alien set, because the alien killer also has a lot of rules. So when you're pulling out that set and playing the original stuff out of it, it's like, be ready to sit down for a little bit and like learn how this works. And so that was kind of a downside early on. And I've talked about how I like sometimes in locations I can just pull out and play. That said, some of that complexity is also what like opens up so many different things that can happen. And the way that the USS Conrad works is it has these key cards that you start the game with one of them and you can get other ones through the different decks and they can do different things on the ship. So for example, you can unlock like a secret passage, like through the vents or whatever, that now you can move through that. So you're actually like changing the, the map a little bit, but the enemies cannot move through it. But then there's things like you could fire up the furnace or the trash compactor. Um, or even I had a game recently that I set off the self-destruct sequence if you get enough keys. And then it's going to blow up in two turns and you have to get to one of the life pods. And so while it's a lot of extra stuff to like keep in mind how it's working, and you might have to remind yourself when you pull it out again, man, does it create for some different sessions and some fun opportunities for just the game to play out differently, which that's what's so fun about Final Girl is to be able to mix and match and have such a unique experience. And for that reason, at least with my game so far, I have to give USS Conrad the nod. Also love the theme. It's a very fun setting to be like, you're on this spaceship trapped with, you know, whatever the killer is. Um, so there you go. USS Conrad jumps to my number one. Let's keep it rolling with killers. So killers, there are actually 12 because there are two vignette expansions as well as well as the 10 that came with the uh, locations um so let's rattle these off i'm actually going to be starting with one of the vignette expansions at number 12 which is going to be terror from above this is the birds <laughs> you know the alfred hitchcock the birds movie theme of the birds are attacking and swarming and growing i actually haven't seen the movie so maybe it would help me get into this theme a little more I think this is, it's a fun one to play. It's very different from any of the other ones because you basically have birds popping up all over the place and just slowly like growing to three in every space until they take over the map, which is how you would lose. Um, and you need to 
save people to get your special ability, which then brings out these special victims, and then you need to save those victims. So all you have to do to win is like save victims. That's really the focus. Um, and I think I, it just kind of plays out similarly each time you play it because it's kind of this growing of all the birds, you know, kind of taking over the map. Um, you're never really forced to fight them other than to like keep them from overtaking so much. So a lot of it is just like running around and getting people as quickly as possible. Um, it's one that I'll, I'll definitely keep in my rotation and pull out. But for me, it's maybe the least interesting of the killers. Next up, I have the Big Bad Wolf, which is one of the season two. This is was the very vanilla um, of the season two. I mentioned some of the season two ones are very complicated. This one is nice and easy to understand. It has this mechanism of it's in hunt mode, but once it, I think, kills two or like moves up two on its bloodlust track, then it switches into hunt mode, um, which is kind of interesting, though, in my experience, the since it only takes like two for it to get to hunt, it almost happens like right away, at least in the games I've played. And so then that makes that less interesting because it's like, well, he's in hunt mode now. He's, there's not really like this differentiation. Um, and so I think he, he drops on the list just because it hasn't, at least my plays haven't been that interesting, not very memorable, which memorable is one of my you know things that I'm looking for. Um, with some of these, still a nice one to mix in as a vanilla killer, um, but drops kind of low on my list. Next up, I have one that actually I love the uniqueness of. This is the poltergeist, the ghost haunting the mansion, and probably the most unique in that it really changes how you win the game. You cannot damage the ghost directly. Rather, there is this Carolyn little girl that is introduced into the environment that you need to save. And so it's all about saving Carolyn and getting her out of there. Um, the thing that lowers this one, despite it being such a nice theme and like very memorable sessions with it is it is really really swingy on the luck because basically carolyn gets shuffled into the item decks and so if she's shuffled into an item deck that's and she's at the bottom of a deck that's like the last of the three rooms you check i mean you just never had a chance and you know that's maybe true of some of the other rng elements in final girl but it feels a little more um, just brutal when it's like, oh man, like I can't, I couldn't even find her. Um, and so I think that makes it a little harder to want to play it a ton because it feels like that initial setup is going to dictate a lot about how much success you are going to have. Um, it also means that if you're not finding her, you're basically search, 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 um, which maybe is a little less uh, dynamic um, in you reacting to what's happening on the map. Still love having it, though, because I think it's a really cool execution of the theme, and it's fun to bring it into some of the different maps. Um, just don't want to play with that particular win condition all the time, which I see, keep saying that. That's one of the great advantages of Final Girls. I rotate through all this content, so there's really not anything that I'm playing over and over again. Next up, number nine, we have Inkanyamba the Avenger. This is going to be basically ditto for what I said about Sacred Groves, because Inkanyamba has almost the exact same mechanism of having this like divine wrath track that it goes up and then it can trigger and the higher it is up on the track it hurts you so i didn't love it in sacred groves so for the same reason i don't love it within kenyamba and again that might just be because it's brutally beaten me down <laughs> a few times especially when i was playing both of them on the same map um but it's you know it's a cool one to mix in I, i'll be interested to see if as i play it more I have a little bit more success, and maybe that changes my opinion about it a little bit. Number eight, we have the other kind of most vanilla uh, killer from the original set, and this is Hans the Butcher. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty vanilla, kind of like I was talking about with the Big Bad Wolf, but I think I just have had better games, more interesting games with Hans. I don't know. Maybe that's just randomness. Um, but... He's a nice one to pull out and just not have to think about extra rules and have a good game with. I find that he's hard. Um, just a lot of brutal, uh, directly kind of attacking type of cards. Um, but I've had good games with him. So he's kind of just a you know, middle of the road uh, killer for me. Next up, we have the other vignette expansion, which is Terror from the Grave. It's the zombie um, one. And it's in some ways similar to the Terror from Above. That There's all these little zombie tokens kind of like there were lots of birds but i have found the terror from the grave to just be a lot more dynamic and interesting than the birds um vignette and the really the reason why is like 
they come out and they actually move. Unlike the birds that kind of just sit and, you know, accumulate. Um, they actually move around and they'll, when they get together, if there's, I think three of them, they'll form a zombie horde, which then you, you know, need to kill these hordes and they're, they, they have scaling health. Cause every time they run into another zombie, it gets absorbed in the horde and that gives it more health. And you're ultimately trying to avoid three hordes from being created. And in the games I've had, that has created some fascinating situations because if I have two hordes out there, I need there not to be another horde. I actually almost want singular zombies to get absorbed into these hordes just so that they aren't getting together to create that third horde. And then the other thing I really like compared to the birds again, and I only compare those because they're a little bit similar um, with the vignettes, um, is it actually does come down to really like killing these zombie hordes and actually attacking them, which is a little bit more of a satisfying climax than in the birds. That's just like, I ran out of there and let the birds take over the place. Um, so I've had, I, I find this to be a very interesting kind of creature as it morphs and like you're managing the different hordes and um, I've had good games with it. So it, it actually rose up my list a little more than maybe I was expecting. Next up, number six, we have Dr. Fright. Um, I, I don't know a lot of these uh, actual horror. I think it's Freddy Krueger or something. <laughs> I haven't seen most of these films. Um, but he's kind of got this, he's like the dream doctor. And so you have this thing that you go into these weird dreams where he pulls you into his furnace room and like is going to kill you and it's weird. Um, and so there's this concept of whether you're awake or whether you're asleep. But being asleep is also the only way you can actually fight him. So there's a, there's a reason you actually want to eventually. And whenever you're asleep, you have to like escape the boiler room. And there's this weird, like there's these four cards that you shuffle and you have to like slide them. And if it reveals him like in the corner, then that means that I think he attacks you or you don't wake up or I can't, it's been a little while since I played this one, um, which is kind of a cool mechanism. I will say, I don't love the gimmicky card thing because ultimately once you kind of decide your you know system for going through that it's just a probability of whether you're going to see them i would almost rather just roll dice to determine that rather than like uh, i need to pick up these cards and make sure i don't accidentally see something i shouldn't and like slide them and then you know set them down and then carefully pick up the splayed cards again it's a little finicky to get the same end result um as if i just rolled some dice um but Whatever the case, it's it's still an interesting uh, dynamic of the sleeping versus not and how you manage that when you want to be asleep and when do you not. Um, so I think that still um, kind of elevates on this list despite, despite me not loving the kind of finickiness of how that's implemented. Uh, next up, Geppetto, the Puppet Master. So his map, the carnival, was my least favorite location, but I actually do find him to be a very interesting one to fight against. Um, not a lot of these killers have minions with them. There's kind of the mechanism that killers could also have minions that are doing something. Um, but Geppetto is one of the best examples, and he's an interesting example because not only does he have these puppet minions, but the puppets are essentially tied to him, you know, puppeteer. And so there's like a limit in how far they can move from Geppetto. And that just creates some interesting dynamics on the map as he's moving and they're also moving, but they can maybe only move so far because of him. You know, you can picture kind of what's happening with, with the puppet. Um, and so I find that to be kind of a fun, it's definitely a nice change of pace to kind of have a little bit more going on with the killer and some extra minions instead of just a singular um, killer. Um, so I think he's an interesting one. And that really is what shoots him up the list a little bit here into my top half. Uh, which then brings us to, I guess my top four are all season two. And I think that's just a testament to season two, I think kind of explores the system a little more creatively. And so as someone who's played the game a lot, that becomes more interesting. Someone who maybe hasn't played the game a lot, it's going to be a little bit more rules overhead and stuff. So it's maybe something worth considering. Um, but my number four is one that has some of the most rules overhead and that is the organism. This is the thing, um, as far as the movie reference, um, where you, some people at your camp, or if you're playing on the uh, outpost, you can play it on any location, but some of them have been exposed and you don't know, like, are any of them actually assimilated and actually have turned into this organism? And so at the beginning of the game, there's three random victims that have been exposed 
And you need to go and either apply a test kit to figure out if they're exposed or bring them to the lab. There's a location that's made the laboratory and test them. Or if they end up getting kill, killed by something, they'll just like de- determine then whether they've been exposed. Um, but if they're exposed, they're going to be revealed as, you know, now there's a killer on the map, one of these organisms. But if they're not, then you basically turn them into a normal victim and that's, that's all done. And so you need to expose all these and then any that were actually the organism you need to then defeat. Now, this doesn't mean it is a little swingy because you could have anywhere from one to three organisms in a game. And if you get three, I mean, you're just, I don't even know how you'd win. That said, it is not likely because each time you um, test someone, there's, I think, three cards and there's a one in three chance that you're going to get the one that says that they're affected. If they're affected, that just shuffles back in and that'll be the deck for the next time. If they're not affected, that card's removed. So the next time it's just going to be a one in two chance. If the second one isn't, you're guaranteed there's going to be at least one. That does mean that the only way you're getting three is what, a one in 27 chance because you'd have to hit that one in three three times in a row. I guess it would be memorable. It hasn't happened to me yet. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit more to every time I've played it, I've had to go back in the rule book and kind of understand it. But it is interesting. It is a very interesting dynamic with like there's no killer initially. And you got to figure out, okay, I need to apply these tests and figure out. And then like once one comes out, well, I still need to apply tests to these other ones. Do I focus on getting rid of the guy? It may depend on which organism came out because there's kind of three different levels. You might have gotten the biggest one, in which case you're probably in trouble. Um, but very interesting and very uh I'm very impressed by the final girl system, just the flexibility of the core system for some really creative implementation of some of these um, different themes. And I think they nailed the thing theme in being able to kind of um, represent that you don't know who it is and then how many are there and taking care of them. So that pushes organism up to my number four. Number three, I have the ratchet lady. Um, And again, when I was thinking about this, I feel like it might be clouded a bit by me just having some really good games with the Ratchet Lady. Um, But she's basically got this mechanism where she'll turn victims into maniacs, which I mentioned it's kind of, I kind of like some of these ones that bring in a little bit more than just the singular killer, just to kind of make it interesting. It makes the map a little more interesting of what's going on. Um, So there's these maniacs. You do actually have a new action card that you can like calm them down to turn them back into victims. Um, and so there's kind of an interesting dynamic of that growing as the game goes on. Other than that, I think I like that she's just not complicated. It's not, while I sometimes like playing something like the organism that I need to remember some rules, it's nice to not need to remember much and just be able to play that out. The the maniac stuff is pretty simple. Um, so yeah, just a really good solid one, um, rises up to my number three. My number two is probably the other example of a complex you're probably gonna have to read the rules quite a bit before you start and this is the evomorph the alien and the reason this is a little more complicated is because there's like an evolution of the alien so it starts as a hatchling which is like super deadly like you probably don't want to i don't know that i would ever want to actually go after it right away because it's like you would die if it like actually hits you um but once it makes i think its first kill it evolves into a youngling and it like disappears so there's this element of like if you're playing on the ship it's like it's disappearing into the vents but you can imagine some of these other locations how it's disappearing and then the, at different times it'll like ambush and you draw one of these ambush cards to determine like what's happening with it um and eventually once it makes enough kills it's going to evolve into the full adult in which case it still hides in ambushes but it's much much worse um but you do have a defense against these ambushes because there's a new scan card that you can, while it's hidden, you can scan and basically confirm it's not in your location. And so you get to put a little X token in your location. And a lot of the ambush cards when they come out will say go to you know the farthest non-X location. And so if you stayed in that X location, you're guaranteed to be safe from that ambush. So it is an interesting as you're trying to like, okay, it disappeared. I want to take this opportunity to maybe save some victims and do some stuff. But should I also like protect myself against a potential ambush? Um, Very cool. Very thematic. Um, I think it just, the dynamic of him going off the map and coming back just adds a whole nother um, level of interest to how how it's playing out uh, with the killer. So I've had some really fun games with the Evomorph. And my number one is 
following the same theme of me saying it's kind of fun when you have multiple kind of entities belonging to the killer doing things. This is the intruders, which literally just is three killers. Like instead of minions, there's just three separate killers that are going around and a different one is going to be selected at a different time. And it's not complicated. Like unlike organism and unlike evil morph, it doesn't have any like, wow, that's such a cool, clever, you know, implementation. It does some really interesting things. It's more that just the fact that there's three and the way the you know terror events and the the switching between them works it just makes for a very dynamic game and at least and i can only speak from the times that i've played but the times that i have faced the intruders it has always just been so interesting of figuring out where am i at risk which intruder do i want to try to bring down first because you're going to have to kind of end up defeating all of them and so there's just a lot of strategy in how you handle that like oh i could hurt this killer now, but is that worth it? Because I don't want to like be working them down evenly because then I'm having to deal with three killers this whole time. I ideally want to eliminate one. Um, so I just found it to be a really fun one to play against. Um, some of it, it's hard to remember like what made those sessions so fun. Some of it probably was terror cards that did interesting things with them, or some of it was their their dark power finales that used them in an interesting way. But I just know that the games I've had with them have been a lot of fun. And I think just the way they're designed um, makes it that they're consistently going to provide that interesting game. Whew. We are through locations. We are through killers. So we are going to rapid fire 26 Final Girls. Now, Final Girls kind of have two parts to them. There's the front side, which is as you save victims, you can select which slot to get that bonus. So different Final Girls have different bonuses you can get, and that can play a little bit into, you know, my opinion here. But then the bigger part is probably the once you rescue enough, you get the special ability for that Final Girl that's like an ongoing effect. Um, so it's a combination of those that are making up this ranking. I've played with these all at least once, but this is making these rankings, especially more so than the locations or killers, feels a little bit like thrown together. But we'll, we'll talk through them. I also have the deck here in front of me because unlike locations and killers, I do not remember all the final girls. Uh, we're going to start out with someone had to be last. And in this case, it was Nancy. And when I look at it, I don't like see like it's not like i dislike it i like some of the actions on the front to be able to like take cards or a move two spaces i love ones that let me move because so often you're wanting to move after saving people um i think what brings her down a little bit for me is the special ability is kind of fine i it's clever because you final girl has this thing where you have these final health tokens and when you die you flip your final health token and there's a chance like a one in three chance that you got one of the ones that gives you extra health and you got to live. The same actually happens for the killer, so you can have some of these dramatic moments. So that's a very fun moment in the game is to see, like, did I survive? Do I still have a chance? What Nancy does is each time you lose health, she can reveal one from the unselected and potentially swap it. So you're just increasing your chances of getting one of those ones that gives you extra health, which is cool. And I like the way that, like, if you know you have an extra health, you can actually play risky and like let yourself take a hit because you know you'll survive it and you could maybe use that to your advantage. The thing I don't like is, one, you might already be getting that health, but it's also taking away kind of the fun surprise from it. So it's, it's kind of less exciting, I guess. Um, so it's just not an ability that gets me particularly excited to use. Next up, we have Adelaide. I feel like she continues a trend of, uh, I guess, both uh, Inca Yamba and Sacred Groves were lower ranked for me. She's kind of the titular, man, I cannot say that word, character in uh, that set. And she's fine. You know, nothing to, to get excited about really with the rescue abilities. And then you get like a one-time big bonus of either recovering all your health or getting six worth of cards. Or if you happen to be playing on one of the, the maps or against Inken Yamba, you could decrease the wrath. Um, it's fine. And I guess in that moment, depending on the moment, it could be huge to like get, the, get that one-time thing. But I think one-time things tend to be a little less fun than unlocking something for the remainder of the game. So it drops a little bit on my list. Gretel, coming in, number 24. Um, I actually love the double horror uh, 
save because like, getting your horror track down means that you can get to rolling three dice, which is really big. So I do like that on the front. Uh, the back is, it's a fine ability. Whenever you can convert specifically a two, so not a one, but a two would normally be a miss. You can convert that to a star by discarding three action cards. Now, normally you can, with threes and fours, discard two action cards. That's cool to have that opportunity and it could save you. That said, it already feels painful to discard two cards to get a success. Discarding three is just like, man, it's it's just a lot to give up and you'd have to have it. And then it basically makes your less, next turn less fun because you've got rid of all the cards that you were going to be using. Um, so a little less excited about that ability. Let's go. Number 23. Selena also has a double horror like that. Um, gets more dice when searching. Uh, that's cool. It, 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 like situationally, that's nice to have. Um, to, hopefully you haven't done all your searching at that point so you can go take advantage of it. Um, but it doesn't get me super excited. You know, you might be successful with the search anyway. It's just kind of like scaling your odds. Um, next up is Asami, number 22, who I think if I'm remembering is similar. Yeah, I think this is similar because it deals with items. Um, actually very similar, uh, rewards for rescue, but whenever you draw at least one item card, you get to draw an extra one and choose one. So it's almost guaranteeing that you get like the better version of search, the most successful where you get to see multiple cards. Um, I maybe like this a little better than Selena just because it kind of guarantees that you're seeing that extra card. Um, she also has immune to trap cards. That's only going to matter if you're playing on my least favorite location. Um, so it's fine. It's fine. Next up, we got Melanie, number 21. Uh, you need to get six to uh, unlock her final ability, but it is pretty powerful. Once per action phase, you can choose to lose a health to do two damage among enemies in your space. Super powerful and actually really nice because a lot of times you can find yourself in games where it's hard to find ways to do damage if you haven't found weapons or something. I think for me, it's just a little lower because it's not an exciting way to do damage. I'm not rolling to, to do it. It's just like, I hurt myself. I applied the damage. Very deterministic. Nice to have the you know control there, but you lose a little bit of the excitement that's kind of where the highs in Final Girl tend to come from. Number 20, we have Patsy. She's got some nice uh, movement options on her rescues. Uh, once per action phase, you may deal or spend two time to deal a damage to an enemy in your space. It's really my same thoughts I had on Melanie of really nice, flexible option, but not really an exciting option um, when you're actually pulling it off. Next up, we have Charlie, who is another expensive one in that you have to get six people to unlock. I like lots of movement and horror cancellation. Those are some of my favorite things there. So I actually do like um, the options there. She has that during the action phase, you can lose three health to take critical blow into your hand. So this is kind of similar to the ones we talked about. Like you're taking a cost to potentially do damage, but here it maintains the excitement of it, right? Because I'm not just getting two free damage. I'm getting critical blow, which could be the big play. Um, and I think it's just more fun to get the card to be able to execute on that damage than just getting it for free. Next up, 18, we've got Barbara. Have to point out on Barbara, and we'll probably see this on a few of the Final Girls as we've got my list. Killer uh, ability when rescuing a victim to take any top item card. So you usually can see the three items that are currently available on the tops of the decks. This, without even being there, you can just grab one of those. Absolutely huge. Um, her ability is very interesting. You can now have victims follow you into the killer space. Normally they won't follow you if you're going to the victim space. And when you damage the enemy, you can basically sacrifice the victims to do additional damage. So it's almost like they're helping you. But if you do this, you don't have to increase the bloodlust for the victims that died. So this is interesting because it gives you kind of some options for bringing victims in and using them to do extra damage. But you also have a way to get rid of victims besides rescuing them to keep them from affecting the bloodlust. Because normally if the killer comes and kills them, bloodlust is going to go up, the killer is going to get harder, get their power, all kinds of bad things. Um, so some interesting decisions that this introduces of, oh, like I think these people are going to die. Maybe I can use them to go do some extra damage and avoid that bloodlust. So I, I like that one. I, I, I think that's uh, got some, some interesting uh, situations that that can bring up. Next up, we have Veronica, who clearly 
loves time. Veronica is all about time. So everything gives you time and time is what you use to purchase cards. So this is really just tons of flexibility because the more time you have, the more you're going to be able to build out your hand for whatever the situation is at that moment. Her ability just doubles down on that, making your default time go up to seven instead of six. And be noted that each additional victim save gives you three time. A lot of uh, final girls will give you one time for rescuing. Three is a lot. So it's maybe not flashy, um, but kind of a cool one because it uh, you know gives you so much flexibility with the time and feels different from some of the other final girls. Next, we have Sheila. Uh, has some cool ones for uh, taking action cards. I always like ones that let you immediately take an action card. You have to get six to get through here, though. But she has a cool effect that from now on, when you discard a card for time, instead of just getting one time, you get two time. And so, especially with all the like zero cost cards that keep coming back to your hand, you have a way to really scale up um, you know, your buying power by sacrificing these. So in some ways, kind of similar to Veronica, because you're really getting more time power. It's a little more controlled by you situationally. I will say I do love the additional victim save to reduce a horror being coupled with the time instead of just more time, because there are situations where being able to manage horror is also very important. Next up, what are we into the, we're getting towards the top half of the list here. We've got Layla. Um, Layla has a cool one because it's take an action card and it's any action card at max two. So there's definitely some flexibility there. And speaking of flexibility, when you get her final ability, you get to choose a signature action out of play and add it into your hand. So the second season added these, I think it was like 10 different signature actions, which each game you can like randomly introduce one to kind of make so that you don't just have the exact same tableau of cards every time. So it's kind of a fun way to spice it up. She gets to look at those other nine and just pick one of them, which is very cool because you can situationally decide which one's important for you. And then that card stays in the game and cycles and you can continue using it. Um, you'll see that uh, something I do like in a lot of the final girls is ones that are flexible, not super situational, because, you know, when you unlock that final girl, it's nice to be able to make it work for what you need right now. And I think Layla is a good example of that. Next up, we have Kate, who only has four health, but has tons of ways to get health. Um, so you'll notice besides getting health, the cards that she can get for saving people is guard, guard, retaliate, which are all protection cards. And then once you unlock her ability, you immediately get all her health. Her health bumps up to seven. And as long as you can stay at full health, you get a plus one to all of your rolls. And I think this is very cool. One, you go from being kind of a uh, you know, character with not a lot of health kind of surviving to suddenly you're this tank with seven health. And you have this new fun thing of if I can manage my health to keep it full, I can get an extra die, which is cool. Not to mention two health. Uh, recovered for each victim save. She can she can stick around. Next up, we got Lori, who I think of as like the OG final girl because she's on the front of the original season one uh, Camp Happy Trail set. Um, she's got six that you got to get here, all very basic stuff. And her ability is very simple, but I have to admit, it's very nice to have and it's very powerful, which is whenever you are in the same space as an enemy and inflict damage, you do an extra damage. So often the game of Final Girl comes down to you being in a space with an enemy and fighting it out. Um, and something like that can absolutely be the difference in being able to go in there and win it. So always happy to have more damage. Next up, number 12, Constance. Um, has, again, take top item card. Love that one. So flexible, so fun because it allows you to get an item. And then she has an interesting one that you can use any weapon in your hand from range zero to two. I just talked about how so often it ends with you being in the same space and trying to kill out. Well, suddenly your knife or whatever, you can from spaces away attack with it. I don't actually know the theme here. Constance is definitely from one of, uh, I think it's one of Van Ryder's other games. I don't know if she's got some weird magical abilities going on here or something. Um, but very, very powerful because it also opens up your ability to be able to hit the uh, killer at range while you're also trying to kind of like run and not get hit yourself. Um, so very nice one to have. Next up, we have Ginny, another six uh, people, pretty standard uh, rescue abilities. And this one, very 
uh, it's not like flashy, but it's super flexible. You get to choose two of the following um, that will resolve like bonus for those actions for the rest of the game. So for example, I might get her and be like, man, I need to still do a lot of movement and I'm going to need to attack the killer at the end. I might say my walks are always plus one move and my weak attacks are always plus one damage. That is massive. It's similar, a little similar to Lori with the plus damage, but like this, I can pick my situation. It may be that like, I really need to get manage my horror and having a plus one horror cancellation on focus, super powerful. So I really like the flexibility of Jenny. Uh, we are into my top 10, top 10 final girls. We've got Jeanette. Um, Jeanette's only got four, but one of them is that top t- take any top item card, which I love, especially because her ability re- kind of requires you to have a good item card to take advantage of. First off, you have an additional hand for purposes of carrying things. You can potentially have more equipped at once. But then it gives you two tracking markers that you can use instead of using the tracking markers on an item. So a lot of times items will have a limited number of uses. This can extend the limited number of uses by two. And I love that because one, you know, you may have, knowing you have that, you can seek out an item that that could be really good with. But the items are location dependent. And there's so many different, you know, one or multiple use items across these locations. So how this plays out is so variable and you could have some very cool situations where you're able to use some things that you weren't normally able to use multiple times. Um, So I think that's very cool if you can pull it off. Uh, Number nine, we have Yuki, I believe that's pronounced. Um, Cool, she can get a Furious Strike. Um, That's a powerful card to be getting um, for a rescue there. Um, But once per turn, you may play a copy of Guard Uh, the guard card as though it was in your hand so often you know so much of final girl not dying is managing when is the right time to get those guard and retaliate cards and make sure that you're protecting this is so powerful to be able to always have a guard each turn even if you didn't get one but even if you did there's turns where you get attacked two or three times a lot of times when you're not playing with a character like this i might have retaliate and guard and there's like you know i may not have enough cards or enough time to get enough cards to block all those she gives you that ability to block subsequent attacks um so very very powerful one for survival next up number eight we have alice um great movement has a move two spaces and move one space as well as a flexible take any two cost action card um but this is another one that's very flexible um kind of like what was it Ginny or someone that let you kind of pick which thing to upgrade she gets to choose one named action card. And for the remainder of the game, whenever you play that action, you get to roll five dice, no matter what. And that's just awesome. Like, depending on your situation, you could make your walk card, like, just completely powered up with that. You can make it a certain attack card. Um, so you can adapt it to your situation. And it's fun to roll a lot of dice. So it lets you do a fun thing in how it actually implements that benefit. So very fun one with Alice. Next up, we have Agnes. Uh, she takes a while to get there with six, but when she does, she gets to gain two ultimate dice of her choice. So this is another season two concept. It introduced these, I think there's six ultimate dice that when you unlock your final girl, if you're choosing to play with this module, instead of taking your final girl ability, you could choose to take one of the ultimate dice, depending on how many victims it was, instead. And they're typically not quite as powerful as the abilities. Um, but it gives you that flexibility. And so I actually really like playing with them um, because there's situations where it's like, oh, I got my final girl ability and it's like, this is not really going to help me with what I have left in this game, but it would really help me if I got, you know, the move ultimate die that'll give me a chance of getting extra movement. Um, So very cool that Agnes just gets to pick two. It makes that more of a direct part of the game and you get two of them. You get just the possibilities of which ones you could pick is very flexible. Um, So I think that's a fun ability. Heather is my number six. Let's see here. Pretty basic, but has to get six. When attacking, for each five or six on your horror, initial horror roll, you can re-roll another die, and then you get an extra damage for every star in the result. So this has like the fun kind of exploding dice thing of every success you get, you get re-rolls to go for an even bigger attack. And then besides that being good and fun because you're getting to re-roll, you get extra damage for every star, that's an insane, you know, ceiling for damage you have there. Um, 
So I love the fun of the getting to re-roll and also just the potential of having some big moments, especially because you could have a time that it's like, you know, there's situations in the final goal where it's like, I'm not going to win because I can't survive another turn and I can't do enough damage this turn. She potentially could like open the door for a really big attack if you get lucky. Number five, we have Raiko. Pretty basic uh, rescue abilities. But once per action phase, if an enemy is within two spaces, you may move to that enemy's space full of free. Love the free movement here. And like, I love that you can use this in kind of two different ways. One is like, I'm not ready to, to beat the killer yet, but I can use him as a stepping stone to where I want to go. Like I want to get over there. Well, I can jump to your space for two and then run away. And I basically save movement. But then at the end of the game, a lot of times you're needing to buy movement cards because you need to move and attack. She could potentially save you some time to just focus on buying strong attacks because she can jump directly uh, to his space. So I, I definitely like that one. Number four, we've got Ellen. I think she came in the alien set. Um, can take a search card. I like that. Nothing too exciting on the rescue abilities. but. When successfully resolving a search action, you can choose to freely look through all the location's unused items instead of the space you're on. So when you set up a game of Final Girl, you seed those th th usually three locations with like four items each. And then there's a bunch of items that just go back to the box that aren't used that game. And that's, you know, fun for the variability. Well, she gets to go look at that other stack that's bigger than one the ones that are at the locations and just pick anything. So very fun, like the selection you get, like just the chance that you can get the perfect item for your situation. Um, love it. Good stuff. Number three, we have probably the most unique final girl, and that is Julia. She only has one rescue ability before you unlock her uh, a bit her final girl ability. And it just gives you a time, but once she is in her final girl mode, because she actually switches back, you can choose to kill a victim in your space. I think she's a vampire. Again, this is one of those uh, ones from one of uh, Van Ryder Games' other games that I'm not familiar with. Um, but I think she's a vampire, which would make a lot of sense with this ability. You can choose to kill a victim in your space to either recover all your health or inflict damage on an enemy and recover health. I think in that case, you just, you just recover one health or immediately move two spaces, ignoring any movement penalties. So there's a few things I love about this. And, and then you flip the card back over. So you have to like keep getting the one to have the opportunity to do that ability again. So very different from other final books. One, love the flexibility. I love that each time I do this, I could choose to get health back because that's really important. I could choose to do damage. I could choose to get movement. So I love the flexibility. I love that it's like this weighted decision because you'll notice it doesn't prevent bloodlust. If I kill the victim, it's still going to raise bloodlust um, and make the enemy stronger or closer um, to unlocking things. Um, so it is a decision you have to decide to make. And then I just kind of like the rhythm of it. You know, it flips back and you want to try to do it again to get your option to be able to do this powerful thing. Um, so very cool, unique one to play that I think was implemented really well to create um, some unique sessions. My number two is actually similar, I think, to, was it Raiko, my number four, that kind of gave you the free movement um, to the enemy. But Red's got one very good abilities on the rescue abilities. You have take any top item card, which is pretty much my favorite one. You've got to move two spaces in a single one and to take an action card of any two. Tons of flexibility here. But then her... Ability that's similar to Raiko's is once per action phase, if an enemy is within two spaces of you, you may move one space for free. Very similar, though, if it's two spaces away, I actually can't get to the enemy. But what makes me like this one even better is it's not just move to the enemy, it's one space. So this is so flexible. I could be running away from the enemy, and that one space can help me run away from the enemy. Similarly, I could use it during the game to, you know, get extra movement um, as I'm like passing by the enemy. Um, so just a very just flexible ability for movement. And additionally, she's got good ability to, to recover health by saving people even after she's flipped. So just very well-rounded, uh, love what's going on there with red. But that brings me to my number one final girl, which is Ava. And you'd look at her uh, rescue abilities and be like, huh, it's nothing there to get excited about. And that's true. But I just 
love the ability, which is when making a horror roll, you always re-roll your ones. And that includes on re-rolls. You can always re-roll your ones. And I've talked about with some other ones, rolling dice is fun in this game. Like, and so having the opportunity to get all these re-rolls, you know, it isn't just like, oh, your threes count or something. You get like extra excitement and it's kind of like there's this always this chance that you could could get it. Um, and paired that with the, uh, you know, horror reduction. I always kind of like that on the backside. But really, it is that ability alone that moved Ava up my list. I just think it's fun to get to re-roll ones. Um, and so she makes my number one final girl. And there you have it. I think I clocked in at almost exactly an hour. My voice is feeling it. Hopefully that was fun, whether you love Final Girl and uh, have played some of these, in which case I would love to hear in the comments below what are some of your favorites, what are your thoughts on some of my rankings. Or maybe you hadn't heard of Final Girl, and this is maybe a just a good intro to a lot of the variety that you can find in this game and some of the flavor in this game. Um, I hope you enjoyed the countdown. Hey, thanks for sticking with me or just jumping to the end. Either way, uh, we have some videos here that you can check out on the channel and we will see you in the next one.